Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Meeple University on the Dice Tower. Today we'll be teaching you how to play The Millennium War, a game designed by Chuang Pham and Khan Tran and published by Winged Titan. We are using a prototype copy of the game and so the rules and components may not be final. Now let's get to the table. In The Millennium War, the Millennium Gate is opened, drawing together the sinners and the virtuous, as well as the beasts, to face each other in skirmish combat. The game can be played in two modes. A competitive mode, which is either 1 versus 1 or 2 versus 2, where each player or team will control a team of four heroes fighting each other to the death. Or it may be played as a cooperative battle for up to four players against a boss controlled by the game. In this video, we'll first take you through the rules of the competitive mode of the game and then the changes that you need to know to play cooperatively. To set up for the competitive mode, first lay out the board on this side, the Millennium Arena. The competitive mode can be played as either a 1 vs 1 or a 2 vs 2, but either way, each side of the battle will control a team of four heroes. One side, thematically, will be the virtuous, and the other will be the sinners. Lay out all of the hero cards, and then the two sides will take turns to draft heroes into their teams of four. Choose a first team or player who will take the first pick. The second team or player will take the next two picks. And you'll alternate from there. First side, second side, first side, second side, first side. The side which took the first and last picks will take the first turn in the game. Each hero in the game has an affinity to one of the six elementals or may be a master hero shown by this icon. When drafting, your team may have no more than one master and no more than one hero of each elemental type. Each elemental also has a counter elemental, but this is thematic only. Now set up each of your heroes on one of the hero dials. Track your hit points on the outer rim of the dial. Set your defense on the inner rotating ring and set your attack, represented by the sword, staff, or both, on the outer rotating ring. Then put one of the character pieces into this dial. There are three options. You can use the cardboard token, which you slide into the dial, like so. This shows your character's movement and attack range. You may use the character's acrylic magnetic standee, which also shows its movement and attack range or you can use the character minis. The game's minis will come disassembled, giving you flexibility in construction or the ability to paint before you assemble. Because we'll be teaching you the game from overhead, we'll be using the cardboard tokens. To set up your side of the board, place your four hero cards into their corresponding slots and place your heroes on the starting spaces. Take five ancient structures Add one of these symbols for your side and then place them onto these five spaces around the back of your area. In the center of the board, place the Millennium Gate piece and then shuffle and deal face down six of the level one beast tokens, one onto each of these six beast cave spaces. Place the remaining level one beasts and all of the level two beasts near the board. Finally, separately shuffle the two decks of square cards, the weapons and spells, and the mana. Place them into the double-ended dealer shoe, and you're now ready to play. The competitive mode of the Millennium War is played in turns. In a 1 vs 1 game, players will alternate turns. And in 2 vs 2, the teams will alternate, and so teammates should either sit opposite each other to go clockwise around the table, or zigzag back and forward. On each turn, you will draw new cards, distribute those cards among your heroes, and then take actions with each of your four heroes. Actions include buying weapons, moving, using skills, and attack. Once you've done this with each of your four heroes, play passes to the next player. The competitive game can be won in one of three ways. Firstly, you can kill all four of your opponent's heroes. Secondly, you can destroy all five of your opponent's ancient structures. 
Or thirdly, you can kill and sacrifice at least one level 2 beast matching each of the six elementals in the game. The first team to meet one of these three win conditions wins the game. You will start your turn by drawing and distributing cards. First, you will draw cards from the dealer shoe. Five in a one versus one game, or three in a two versus two game. You can draw cards in any combination from either end of the shoe. However, you must finish drawing all of your cards before you look at any of them. Now you must distribute all of those cards among your team's heroes, discarding any that you can't distribute. Mana cards are distributed into the mana banks of a hero that has that matching affinity. A mana bank can hold any number of cards and this is what that hero will use to spend on skills and weapons. A master hero may hold any sort of mana and master mana may be held by any sort of hero. You may also draw one or more gems from the mana deck and these are distributed according to the same restrictions. Gems are worth 5 mana and can also be spent on actions but cannot be split so must be spent on a single action. Any weapons that you draw from the weapons and spell deck that you wish to keep must go into one of the three slots of your weapons shop. You may freely discard a weapon from your weapon shop to make room for one that you would prefer. Heroes do not gain these weapons automatically, they have to spend mana to gain them and we'll see that shortly. The other type of card in the weapons and spell deck is a spell which is indicated by this book icon in the top left corner. Spells are distributed face down into one of the two inventory slots of the hero you wish to give it to. You may freely discard a card from a hero's inventory to make room for another spell. In the hero's action phase, each of your heroes takes a turn to act and may take any or all of the following steps. They may purchase one or more weapons from the weapons shop. They may move on the board one time. They may execute one of their hero skills, which are printed around the edges of the card. They may use the skill on each weapon that they hold. And they may attack once, choosing to attack an opponent, an opponent's ancient structure, or a beast. All of these actions may be carried out in any order, with the exception that your attack must be your last action. Now let's go through each of these different actions. The first action is to buy a weapon, and here one of the heroes will spend its mana in order to purchase a weapon from the weapons shop and add it to an inventory slot. There are two main types of weapons. Elemental weapons, which will show a coloured mana cost and will have a skill box down in the bottom right corner of the card. And master weapons, which have a wild mana cost and have this numbered box in the bottom right corner. An elemental weapon may only be purchased by a hero with the matching affinity or a master. The cost in mana is paid with any combination of that mana or master mana. The physical class of the weapon must also match with the hero that is purchasing the weapon. Offensive weapons can be physical with the sword, magical with the staff, or versatile showing both. A versatile hero can wield either type of weapon and a versatile weapon can be wielded by either type of hero. Defensive weapons showing the shield can also be wielded by either type. When the hero gains a weapon, it goes into an empty inventory slot. And remember again, you can discard anything from an inventory slot to make room for something else. An elemental weapon will have two boxes. At the top is the skills that are adjusted on your dial related to attack. Here, the hero's attack would be increased by one step. The bottom half is the skill associated with this weapon, and you'll use it during the skills phase of your turn. A master weapon is not linked to any mana type, and so it can be wielded by any hero and paid for using any type of mana. You do still need to meet the physical or magical requirement for wielding an attacking weapon. A newly purchased master weapon may go on an empty slot or it may be stacked on top of an existing master weapon from the same series, indicated by the colour of these numbered boxes here. This allows a fully completed master weapon to be quite powerful, giving you a lot of extra strength or defence. 
To counterbalance this, a master weapon has only an attack effect. There is no skill on these cards. At any point during the game, you may discard a weapon from your inventory in order to make room for another, and you must adjust your dial when you do so. Stacked master weapons are now considered a single weapon, and all cards in that weapon must be discarded at once. The next hero action is move. A hero may move once, up to as many spaces as its move limit, in any one of the eight cardinal directions, that is, north, south, east, or west, or on a diagonal. A hero may not change direction during its move. A hero may not move into or through another hero, whether friend or foe, an ancient structure, a beast cave, regardless of whether or not it contains a beast, or through a wall. But a hero can move diagonally past the edge of a wall. Next we'll talk about skills, and I've pulled this hero's weapons and mana off the main board so that we can see them a little more closely. Each hero has three skills, which are shown around the outer edges, excluding the top, of the hero card. Each elemental weapon also has one skill, shown in this grey and white box in the bottom right corner. On a hero's turn, it may use one hero skill and each of its weapon skills. Every skill has a cost in mana which must be paid in order to take it, and so you can only take as many skills as you can afford. To use three skills here, the hero would need to pay one mana to use Venom, one to use Ghost Form, and overpay with the Earth Gem to use one of the hero skills. Master mana may also be spent as wild. There's a wide variety of different effects and icons associated with skills, and we're not going to go through all of them here, but we'll take you through some of the most critical. The number one represents an effect which will last for one turn, that is, until the start of your team's next turn. Here, for example, you'd pay three, five, or seven mana of any sort to add two, four, or six attack damage for one turn. An infinite effect lasts forever, and generally impacts your battle stats. Here for example you'd pay 2 earth mana to gain 2 defense, and you can use this any number of times during the game. Skills often affect only the hero that uses them, or maybe one target, but one showing this arrow icon is an area effect, which will affect all of a certain type of target within a given range. Here for example it traps all enemies within a 5x5 five five range. So you would trace out a 5x5 five five grid with that hero at the centre, and trap any enemies within that range. The globe represents a global effect, which impacts all of the targets wherever they are on the board. The M is a multicast effect, and so although you can only use one hero skill per turn, you can use a multicast effect any number of times that you can pay for on that turn. And a skill with the pause icon is not played during this phase of your turn. You can pay for and play it when you are attacked by an enemy. As a general rule, any skill which directly harms or weakens an enemy can be used on another hero, but not on a beast. But skills which strengthen your own hero can be used before fights against beasts. There are also many skills in the game which allow you to regenerate your health, but you may never regenerate beyond your starting health. For all of the other icons and skills in the game, we'll leave you to refer to the icon legend or the rulebook. The last action of any hero's turn is to attack, and a hero may attack one valid target which is within its range. Valid targets can include enemy heroes, enemy ancients, and beasts both face up and face down. The range of a hero's attack is shown in the bullseye number, and it is counted in the eight cardinal directions. It is also blocked by heroes, ancients, beast caves, and walls. So within Sim's range is this beast, this hero, and this hero, but this hero is outside range because it's not on one of the cardinal directions, and this ancient is blocked by this hero. As was the case for movement, a wall blocks attack range, but not the edge of a wall. So these two heroes are not within range of each other for attack, but this hero can attack this one. To resolve an attack between heroes, first resolve the attack damage for the attacker. This will equal the attack value on your dial, which already includes any bonuses from weapons, 
plus any extra damage from temporary skills currently in effect. Say for example here, Watabi had played 3 mana to add 4 attack to this 8, giving a total of 12 attack damage. The defender will have a certain amount of defense on its defense dial, coming from its innate defense plus any shields in play, and then has two other effects. Firstly, the player may optionally pay mana to play a pause skill in order to add some extra defense. And secondly, if the defender has at least one spell in its inventory, then that spell must be revealed and played. This is true even if the attack is already completely defended, and if the hero has two spells, the player chooses which to use. The effect of pause skills and spells are added to the defensive effect on the dial, and do note that these can be further defense or they can be counterattacks. And then the total number of shields is deducted from the total number of swords or staffs, and the difference is lost by the defender in health. Here, for example, 12 attack minus 8 defense results in a loss of 4 health. And then the firebomb spell does 3 damage back to the attacker. Do note that it's only swords and staff icons which can be blocked by shields. An effect like this, which simply takes away hearts outright, cannot be defended. Once a spell has been used, it is discarded. Spells are only played in response to attacks, not in response to skills, even skills which cause damage. And all hero attacks are one on one. You cannot team up with your teammates to launch a big attack against an enemy hero. Your second attack option is to attack an enemy Ancient, and again, this has to be within range. Attacking an Ancient is more straightforward. You simply count up all of your swords or staffs and compare it with the defense of the Ancient, which is 5 for the two outer Ancients, 10 for the two middle ones, and 15 for the inner. If your attack damage exceeds the defense of the Ancient, then it is destroyed, and if you destroy all five, you win the game. Your final attack option is to attack a beast which is within range. If the beast is face down, flip it face up. When you attack a beast, targeting its defense value, it will simultaneously counterattack with its attack value. Resolve both attack and counterattack. Here the counterattack is 3 damage versus 2 defense for a loss of 1 health, while the attack is 5 damage against 4 defense which kills the beast. When you kill a beast, gain the benefit printed at the bottom of the beast. Here it's an additional 3 attack damage, and you'll see that through fighting these beasts is a good way of building up the strength of your heroes. Then for a level 1 beast, discard it from the game. Beasts enter the game in waves of 6, and when the last beast is removed from the board, you'll take the next 6 beasts from the top of first the level 1 stack, then the level 2 stack, and add them face down to the beast caves. Once 3 waves of level 1 beasts have been removed, the level 2 beasts will come into the game. Level 2 beasts have stronger statistics, and have some powerful skills which are factored into their counterattacks. But the rewards for defeating them are stronger, and when you've defeated it, you take the beast and add it to the matching elemental slot of your team's sacrifice sanctuary. A master beast can go in any slot. If your team ever completely fills its sacrifice sanctuary with a beast of each elemental, then you win the game. Once again, be reminded that while you can play skills which increase your own attack against a beast, you cannot use a skill directly against a beast to weaken or harm it, unless otherwise stated. We'll now talk about how to play the cooperative mode of the game, which plays between one and four players and pits a team of four heroes up against a boss. Choose your boss and choose the heroes that you wish to play as. Unlike the competitive mode, you may use multiple heroes of the same elemental. As mentioned, there will always be four, so distribute them among the players, and if you're playing with three, one player will play two heroes. You will also need to split the four heroes into two sub-teams, a Virtue team and a Sin team. Refer to the boss information card and set up the map showing for this boss. 
on the Sin side of the board, place the two Sin Hero cards and these Sin Hero dials in the starting spaces. On each of these three spots, place a Sin Ancient. These serve as life counters in the cooperative mode of the game. Do likewise on the Virtue side, and note that each of these heroes has a number underneath it, which can come into play in some of the AI actions in the game. Place a level 1 beast onto each beast cave, but be aware that this time you'll have more than 6. Now take your boss's key components, which will be the main gold boarded info card, all of the AI cards which you should shuffle, and any other cards which come with that boss, as well as two leftover hero bases. Each boss will have two sets of attack statistics and skills, and two different sets of hit points, and during the game, you will start by facing the first set of stats and hit points, and once that's expired, you'll move on to the second. Set up both of these stats on your leftover dials. So here, the active dial at the start of the game has 15 hit points with five attack and five defense, and the secondary dial that comes later has 20 hit points with 15 attack and 15 defense. Place the AI deck here, the two health dials here, and the boss mini in the middle of the board. You're now ready to play. The aim of the cooperative mode is to kill the boss by reducing both of its health dials to zero. You lose the game if all of your heroes and your life counting ancient structures are gone. Turn order in this mode starts with the sin heroes. Each sin hero takes a turn, then the boss, then each virtue hero, then the boss again, and repeat. Unlike the competitive mode, where each team takes an entire turn at once, in the co-op mode, each hero acts separately. A hero's turn begins, as usual, by drawing and distributing five cards. However, unlike in the competitive mode, those cards may only be distributed to that hero's mana bank, infantry, or personal weapon shop. Matching and master mana goes in the mana bank. Non-matching mana must be discarded. Spells may be placed face up into an inventory slot, because now you're playing cooperatively, so it's fine to see each other's spells. And weapons, both of the matching and non-matching mana types, go into the weapons bank. A hero can still ultimately only wield weapons that match its own elemental. However, there is now a new free action, which takes place during the actions phase, where a hero can pass a weapon to another hero, from weapon shop to weapon shop, as long as the other hero is within the attack range of the first hero. This action allows heroes to distribute weapons to the heroes who can use them. There are new teleportation portals, three at each end, and one under each of the side beast caves. And once you've entered one, you can spend your entire turn to teleport to the opposite one. There are certain skills which cannot be used in battles against certain bosses, and information on what these are, or how they change, are shown on the back of the boss's gold boarded card. And be aware that you may still attack beasts, and this is still a good way of building up your character's strength. Once all of the level 1 beasts are gone, once again you'll bring in a new wave of level 2s, but you cannot win the game by collecting level 2 beasts of different elementals the way you can in the competitive game. When it is the boss's turn, you will flip one boss AI card, resolve the movement effect at the top of the card, and then resolve all of that boss's attack effects. Basic boss movement will be to move in the cardinal direction shown here by the number of spaces shown here. So here, moving south one complete width of the boss's base. Bosses are not blocked by beasts, but they are blocked by heroes. And if a boss were to move off the edge of the map, then it stays where it is. Other movements involve moving to a certain numbered mark on the board, moving to the location of a certain hero, or not moving at all. Then, simultaneously resolve the attack effect at the bottom of the AI card, and that boss's base attack, which will be whatever is currently printed on the active health dial. Some AI cards will show two different effects, which correspond to the first dial being active and the second dial being active. And some attack effects will result in an increase to the boss's stats, and when this happens, you will only increase on the active dial, 
not the inactive one. As for the competitive game, a hero's spell is automatically triggered when that hero is attacked by the boss. The heroes may lose the game in one of two ways, by being killed or by running out of time. When an individual hero has its health reduced to zero, check to see whether that team still has at least one of its ancients. If so, discard that ancient, reset that hero's health to its starting value and return the hero to its starting location. The hero keeps any mana, equipment and stats buffs it already has. If a hero is ever killed and that team is out of ancients, then that hero is dead permanently. Once all four heroes are dead permanently, then the heroes lose. The heroes also lose the game if the last AI card is drawn from the deck. To win, the heroes need to first kill the boss on its first health dial, then advance to the second health dial and kill it there as well. Once both dials are down to zero, the heroes win the game. And that's how to play the Millennium War. We hope you enjoyed this video. When we film this video, the Millennium War is going to Kickstarter. So we'll put the link in the description below when it is live so you can check it out. If you find this video useful, please help us by hitting that like button and subscribe to the Dice Tower if you haven't already done so. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave them in the comment section below. See you next time.